What's good with the YouTube of Convex Perspective? It's your boy Flock coming live and direct and with a little bit of energy this afternoon. And today I got a special guest, man. He needs no introduction at all, but we all know him from the past, from the DRF, GUSCD, Operation Black Widow. He was a key figure out here in the Northern California streets. But today he's known as a man, Pastor Rocha. And he's doing the most in the community with his church, House of Rest. Hey, how you doing? How you doing this afternoon, uh, David Rocha? I'm doing good, man. You were gonna say Dino. Uh, <laughs> I get it all. I get it all the time. You know what I mean? Man, it's it's hard, man. I mean, you were talking, right? We're like, man, it's hard to go anywhere, man. Like anywhere you go, you probably get stopped. Hey, that's Dino. That's Dino. Yeah. It's 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 a constant. It's a constant thing, huh? Over yeah. and over again. I mean, honestly, it, it doesn't bother me. You know what I mean? But it's funny because sometimes people will say Pastor Dino, <laughs> and that, I find that funny, man. So, so me and you were talking. Me and you were talking earlier, right? And, uh, yeah. When I reached out to you, I was like, man, you know, everybody knows your story. They know about the DRF. They know about the GUNCD. They know about the Operation Black Widow. But I want to know more about Pastor Rocha today and the things that you're doing in the community, and what has changed you and led you down that path. You know, I'm a firm believer. Like I've told all my viewers, I'm a practicing Christian myself. And God has actually saved my life and gave me a whole different way of living. And, and I try to live with a spiritual solution on a daily basis, man. And I, I want to touch base on your faith and how the things that you do today, how you can help others as opposed to the life that you previously lived. Yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting because... Um... I, I, when I first planted the church in Modesto, I thought I was just going to reach the community in Modesto. And I often, quite, I've often asked myself, why Modesto, you know, and, um, but I realized that on, let me say this, when I got out of prison, I thought people forgot who I was. You know why? Because rap is constantly changing, constantly, there's new music. I thought, man, I, I did a six year bid. So that's long enough for people not to remember who I was, but people did. Matter of fact, they just got bigger. You know, and I, I realize now that my impact isn't just in Modesto, man. It's it's all over the place. I get so many people, so many uh, gangbangers or, or drug addicts or alcoholics or people like they're in the middle of divorce and, and they reach out and for whatever reason, they feel comfortable, you know, emailing me and asking me for advice. You know what I mean? So this goes way further than Modesto. That makes sense, man. So let me ask you something, right? Like, was there a time, right, when you were new in your clergy, as far as, you know, becoming a pastor and all that, you know, that you finally got a breakthrough and you finally realized, man, I can really make a difference. I can really help people. What was that epiphany that happened in your life that you finally realized that you could make a difference? I think there's been a, honestly, there's been a lot of them, but a, a lot of it started in prison, you know, is it, it was my third time catching a felony. Um, and I was just tired, you know what I mean? I'm just like, you know, it's funny because sometimes we got to admit to ourselves that, we're obviously not that good of a criminal if we keep getting caught, you know, yes. and, <laughs> you know, and um, it was a lot of those moments in prison because I started preaching in the yard in Terminal Island, you know, and I did all my time in the feds, you know, and Terminal Island is in Long Beach. And um, I think I, when I realized the impact of that, um, I used to preach in the yard. And this is what's crazy, man, is people would listen, people were walking the track, people were playing uh, basketball, a couple of basketball courts and stuff, and, and people would stop and listen. And um, it, was, it was a trip because one guy, um, one guy had, a, had a conversation with me and he goes, he goes, hey, David, he goes, um, you know why I like listening to you? Because I'll, I'll preach one, one day a week. I think it was a Thursday night on the yard. And um, he was the reason I like listening to you. He was just because you don't tell me I'm a sinner. You don't tell me I'm this. You don't tell me I'm that. He was, I already know I'm that. I'm in prison. He was, what I need is for you to help me get out, for you to help me be free, you know? And I think that was the key right there. I realized, unfortunately, a lot of churches, they make you feel guilty. They make you feel bad. They make you feel, we already know we messed up. You know, we already know, you know, we already, we don't need to know how to do, how to, that we, are, we don't need anyone to tell us we're messed up. We already know that internally. Well, really what we need is, is how to be set free. And so, and speaking to the youth out there, right? Yeah. What, what is the message you can give to these young game makers out there like that were like us back in like the 80s and 90s and living that Mi Vida Loca life and, and, and trying to be locote out there and game banging to the fullest and selling drugs and committing all kinds of crimes like how do you feel like 
what are we as 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 ex convicts, as ex criminals, ex gang members, drug dealers? What can we do today? You feel what is the best message that we can give out there? I, I think what you guys are doing already. I think informing people and letting them know, you know, and it's I, I get it, man. I, I like listening to your videos, and and some of that stuff is is really interesting. A lot of it is really interesting, but I think um. I think a lot of the youth don't understand the downtime. They don't understand the time locked uh, 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 in solitary and you get a letter and something ha bad happened back at home and you can't do nothing about it. You know, and, and I so think, tough. yeah, I think it's stuff like that, man. I think in like, here's the thing, man, your life pauses and everybody's else life keeps going. It's literally like being buried in a glass coffin alive and you can't do nothing as life passes by, you know? And, and I think that's the main thing of, of informing these kids. You know, I, I had a house that I paid for cash. I had all kinds of stuff and I got out. I had to go back to my mom's house as a grown man. You know, I think I got out at 38 years old with nothing, you know? And it's like, if I had worked for everything, nobody could have taken it from me. You know, and it's just like we we want to live a fast track, but as quick as we make that money, illegal money, is is that how quick it could get taken away? Yeah. You know, and there's dudes I used to make fun of, man, squares that I used to see them working at the mall, working at a gas station, or you know, working uh, spraying bugs, and I get out of prison and they own a house now. Yeah. And I'm like, man, who's a square now? You know, I'm living at my mom's. <laughs> So, so we were talking earlier, right? And I asked you about like, you know, what was some of like the situations that you found like yourself into where like you couldn't help the person, you know what I mean? But you had a close relationship and, and you mentioned Pollo. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, it was, um, you know, Pollo Loco, he, to me, he was a Mexican Tupac. You know, um, he was an amazing rapper, man. This dude would, he would be, he would walk in the room and freestyle and you knew it was a freestyle because he was talking about the soda can in your hand the shirt you're wearing your dirty shoes or whatever he's going to make fun of and he would go for like 20 minutes you know and um he was just an amazing artist amazing delivery um i remember um uh he got locked up he went to solano uh i went to visit him a few times i actually recorded him in front of audio love he was on the phone in solano state prison and uh, that was the first, that was his introduction, you know, to to the nation. Really, it was like a little rap, and you can hear that, you know, that little voice that would come on every few minutes. And um, so when he got out and he he paroled out, I actually brought him into my home, you know. And it, it reached a point, man, where I was like, we we were doing some crazy stuff, you know what I mean? And and it reached a point where the music started blowing up. And you kind of reach a point of like, okay, we're still going to keep doing this stuff or, or what? Because this stuff's going to blow up and we're going to end up in prison. What's, what are we doing it for, you know? And he ended up choosing, choosing a different route, a different way, you know? And, and it was really heartbreaking because it reached a point where I had to kick him out of my house. And I don't say that to a lot of people, man, because it's just weird, man, because I had a, I had a lot of love for him, man. And, um, we kind of um, separated. Uh, he wasn't on any music, any records anymore. And he ended up getting shot, my understanding, in an alley and in the back in Merced. And um, his family called me. Uh, by that time, I was already out of prison. I'd already done all my time. And his family called me to officiate his funeral. And that's not an easy thing. You know, you, you have homeboys die and I'm not going to say you ever get used to that, but to actually officiate over your homeboy's funeral, that's a whole different, that's just deep, man. That's deep. That's, that's, that must have been hard, man. Just like, I know it's like throughout the years, it, it's sad because, you know, those people who are continuing to live this lifestyle, I'm seeing people like that. Some people I used to look up to as a kid, now they're homeless out there in the streets. Yeah, I see that you know? too. I mean, I, I never thought I'd see that. You know, some are doing live, some are dead, some are strung out on dope. You know, and, and that's the whole purpose of, of everything we're trying to do is is that criminal lifestyle, it only leads to one result, man. And so I admire the faith that you changed your ways as far as 
the Christianity and how firm you are and how strong you believe. Your story, when I heard it, about everything you went through in the county jail and how they wanted to remove you, that is, is a story that every kid needs to hear, that, that you remain true to your faith, man. Yeah. And what do we have to say to those youngsters out there? Because I'm going to keep it real. There's times where, as a kid where I wanted to believe in God. I wanted to turn my life over to God. But I also wanted to gangbang. And yeah. I, kept on, I kept on serving two masters. There was times when I'd be in, in a cell in the shoe and I wanted to read the Bible and what I was reading sounded good. It sounded beautiful. And I wanted just to be, be blessed by God and I wanted to accept him. But then again, my ultra ego affected me, man. What do you think we could do to help those kids out there understand it's okay to let go? I think that, um, I think a lot of these kids need help, you know, and, and I'll say it like this, okay? I'm, I'm trying to think of a great illustration. Um, I remember the first time I got on an airplane, I was 18. It was my first concert that I actually had to fly. It was kind of like the Richie Valens. They didn't want to get a plane. He wanted to drive everywhere. You know, and back then I used to do autograph signings. I mean, in Riverside and Phoenix everywhere. But this time I had to go and do a concert in Denver. And um, the label was like, listen, man, <laughs> you're not going to drive. We're going to fly you over there. And my first time on a plane. So I was nervous, man. I don't like heights. I don't even like getting on a ladder. You know, and um, it, I had a flight from Oakland to Denver and I was really nervous. Honestly, I was going to the Bay Area where I was going to fly. I was flying with uh, Duke and Crooked and um, I think that's it. I'm not sure who else, but it was a it started raining, man. It, it was raining. It was the black clouds. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to die today. You know what I mean? And there's lightning. You can see lightning in the clouds. And I got on the plane and I was really nervous. Right. So the plane takes off and I. I wish somebody had told me about turbulence. I had no idea turbulence existed. I, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So as I go, I leave Oakland Airport, and we're going into a black cloud, and the plane just started shaking like crazy, and um, it just got worse, and it got darker. And this is in the middle of the day. This is like three o'clock in the day. You already know how the bay gets. You know what I mean? It's just the clouds are just, and. Um, the craziest thing happened. There was a lot of turbulence. It got really black. And all of a sudden, the clouds got white. And boom, we broke through. And it was beautiful blue sky. I say that to say this, is that if I was the pilot, I would have brought the plane down and stayed in the storm. And if I would have, and, and nobody would have told me, if I would have just pushed a little further, I would get past all this darkness and all this blackness. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it totally makes sense, man. And and I think that's what happens, man, is, is people in, in, in prison or youngsters or whatever, they read the Bible and they see hope, but the higher they get, the closer they get, the turbulence hits and the darkness hits and everything hits and the homeboys and this and what they're going to say about me. And you're, you're like, you know what, I'm going to take this plane back down and stay in the storm. That makes total sense. It's, you, uh, me, my, my whole feeling about that, man, was always my ego, man. It was always, I was worried about what other people would think of me, you know, because I felt like I had to live up to being who I was, being Flacco, you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm sure for a while, you felt like you had to live up to being Dino, the reputation that you built out there on the streets, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I, that struggled in my mind, you know, because I, when I went uh, for Operation Black Widow, um, I went 30 days and I bonded out. And I think you talked about that on one of your videos. I guess you guys are tripping because I bonded out. Yeah, they were tripping when you bonded out, man. So <laughs> that's when uh, Pareto was sent over there to, to find you. And I think he found you and also at, at a restaurant in Modesto. Uh, it was Tracy. And we went, Tracy, to, the, yeah, yeah, we went yeah. to Benihana's. And, and, and they, wanted, they wanted to make sure no one had any wires on them. Everybody was tripping off each other. You know what I mean? Yeah, because he's like, hey, man, lift your shirt up. And I'm like, yeah. lift your shirt up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. He said he, he said he lifted his shirt up too. He told I, I met up with him right after that time, and the whole thing was is they were kind of figuring out. Okay, he bailed out on federal bail. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So they were questioning. Okay, is, is he doing this, doing that? But they they located you. You, you showed up. And, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you know, I to, heard the to whole this day, and everything. bro. To this day, I have no idea why they gave me that. You know what I mean? And it's just it's just a trip to me. It's God. So, anyways. While on bail, for those of you that don't know, right, I'm going to show you what kind of a dumb criminal I was. While on federal bail under a RICO federal case, I'm still selling dope. 
You know, so three and a half year, 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 years later, after fighting this case, I get caught selling to another dark room person that used to be in dark room. And uh, the whole time he was wearing a wire. And um, so I get taken to Sacramento County Jail. And that's when um, I, I start doing, I, I got put in a hole, first of all, in, in the eighth floor. It's so long ago, man, I don't remember. I think eight West, if I recall right. You know, jails always change things around, you know what I mean? So, um, but it was there where I finally just gave my life to the Lord. And, and at that point I had to make up my mind what I want to be and what I want to do. And you're right. The ego really plays into it, man, because people recognize me as soon as I hit the pod, everybody knew who I, not everybody, you know, but a lot of the people knew who I was. And then uh, from there I get taken to an active pod, same thing. So I'm getting embraced and, and, and getting shown love and respect because of who I was at the same time. When I go back in my cell after day room time, whatever I'm reading the Bible and I'm just like, at the, after a while of doing that, you know, I'd read the Bible in the cell and then it's day room and I come out, kick it with the homies, play dominoes with them, you know, joke around with them and everything. And then I go back to my cell and I'm reading my Bible and I started realizing, wait, this is conflicting here. And you're right. I had to have that conversation with myself of, of, of am I going to let my ego go or, or what? What am I going to do here? You know what I mean? And um, that's what it came down to. You're right. A lot of that is ego, especially us, man, the type of life that we came out of. Yeah, it's hard, man. It's, it's difficult. When you walk away from that life, it, it's even when you first make that decision, man, I think I know for myself, I second guessed it. Did you second guess it at, at first or were you just all in right off top? Um, I think about 15 months in as being a Christian, I remember my mom visiting me by this time I was in Santa Rita. Because once I got, I had, I had to fight my case for the drug case I caught in, in, in the valley here. And once I finished in Sacramento, the marshals picked me up and they took me to Santa Rita because now I had to face the Rico judge. You know, so I'm sitting there in, in, in the hole in Santa Rita. And I'm just like, this is too much, man. I, I, now I had a conversation with God. I'm like, you know, God, this, this is too much. I said, it's easier if I just roll with the homeboys. God, I'll serve you when I get out. This is just the wrong place and the wrong time. This ain't the time to do this, God. I am sorry. And I remember telling my mom, mom, I'm just going to roll with the punches here because it's, it's too much pressures, you know? It's too much pressures. I, I, I've i said too many things on records. I've said too many things in this. I, I've lived my life a certain way. And I promise when I get out, I'll, I'll go to church the first day I get out and I'll change my life. And so, yeah, I did contemplate that, man. A lot of people don't know about that, but I did contemplate that. And I was at the 15 month mark of my time. Wow. That's, that's, that's awesome to hear that, man. So with all the recent events, you like, you know, with the Cholo Chucker gunner fight, yeah. you, know, you, feel, you feel everything's going in the right direction. You'd like to see this, man. So um, I'm going to hit, I'm going to hit you right now with, with a very, very serious question, man. Yeah. Very personal, man. We want to know who are you supporting, Gunner <laughs> or Cholo Trucker? Oh man, are you serious? Yeah, I gotta put you on the spot, brother. Wow, you know what's crazy is the fact that I'm meeting I'm meeting Cholo Trucker tomorrow when this video plays. So this is gonna be awkward, man. But I got a root for Gunner, man. Yeah, but you know Cholo, what, Cholo Trucker, Cholo huh? Trucker's a good. I had to ask that question. I had to ask that question, man. Yeah, so but you know what? I'm, I'm really, really excited about what they're both doing. I got so much respect for both of them, man. Um, this is breaking ground, you know? It's breaking ground, and everything has to start with something, you know? And I'm really proud of both of them. Uh, honestly, I mean, I'm excited for who I'm just, I'm just looking forward to a good fight. Yeah, I think it's going to be really good, man. It's going to be. Yeah. So are you going to be, are you, gonna, are you planning on the performing out there? Have you made your song yet? No, I haven't, man. <laughs> I haven't. I'm putting you on the spot right now. Yeah, I mean, I do look forward to being there. I do want to pray for both gentlemen right before they fight, um, make myself available, and um, do everything I can to help promote this fight. Because anything about unity, I'm going to be there, man. I want to be in the forefront of it. That's why I was just like really quick, you know what I mean, to to jump on board and jump on this this train you guys have created this and. It's a beautiful thing, man. 
I think that's the main thing a lot of people, I realized a lot of people um, felt toward me from being a Christian was they felt abandoned by me because I, I realized I was a, a mouthpiece. I was a, I don't know what you call it. You know what I mean? Like at least for up here, you know what I mean? Up Northern California. And they kind of felt like I, I, I abandoned them, you know? And, and that's the furthest from the truth, man. That's the furthest from the truth is that I'm here. I'm still here. I'm still here in the central Valley, man. And it's like, I still embrace my people. The only difference is I embrace those that were my enemies too, you know, or people that, that I, people that I was told was my enemy to be more, more clear about it, you know? And, you know, I think when I went on Tony A's show, that was, that was a big deal. That was a big deal for, for me. That was a big deal because that showed unity. You know, the fact that I went down to Wilmington and was embraced and I showed nothing but respect and love at the same time. Um, I didn't sell out who I am, you know what I mean? And, and I think that, I think that was a breaking ground, honestly, leading and opening the door for what you guys are doing, to be honest with you. I, I agree. I watched, I watched all that. It was a big deal, man. You know what I mean? Um, so I seen a little, I seen a little post that you had today about actives and inactives. You saw that? <laughs> Elaborate on that. That was a good one right there. It'll make you think. Yeah, actually, um, I got that. You know where I got that from? I forgot, man. I got a bad memory. Let me look at what I said. But I was watching something Gunner said. And he said uh, something about, he didn't say active or active. He said, because, uh, you know, he, he gives a lot of perspectives from north and south. And he says, oh, you can be a northerner, but you ain't no active northerner. He goes, there's a difference there. And he was doing a spill on somebody. And, you know, that's his business or whatever. But what I said, I said, don't be all active in the streets in the past and suddenly passive for Jesus now. Are you talking about that one or the other one? That one right there. Yeah. And that's true. That's true. You know what I mean? I'm just like, if you're going to go hard, man, you're going to go hard. You know what I mean? And and unfortunately, a lot of people, especially ex-homeboys, not a lot of them, but sometimes they come into the church and they become the quietest ones. And I'm just like, what are you doing, man? You were ready to, you were ready to rock and roll. You were ready to die for something else. So why not live for this? You know what I mean? And that's kind of what I was meaning. Do you, let me ask you something. Do you think that's kind of like somewhat some of our training, like that defensive mechanism, security, and just like not wanting to be receptive to things? Because I'm not gonna lie, at first when I was going to church or, or interacting with different people, I'd be standoffish too. Yeah. You know. It's, it's really difficult to break that cycle, man. You know what I mean? Like, we're institutionalized yeah. in some senses. And sometimes I catch myself, man. I, like, like we were talking earlier, I don't think people realize we talk about all the riots. We talk about, you know, uh, um, how things operate. But they don't understand that that lonely time, that time in a cell, you know what I mean, where you're stuck in your head and, and the stress that comes up here and the mind games that are played, man. I mean, I did time in some environments where I was sent down south and I was the only northerner. And I wasn't, a, I wasn't, only northerner in the whole tier. Wow. No homeboys, no one to talk to me. And, and that was some of the most gruesome time that I ever, ever faced, man. And I ended up getting into it in, in uh, um, ICC, where I, I got into it with the social ward and I tried to take off on them. Yeah. And they threw me in a management cell for, for like a week. No running water, right? My toilet went flush, no blankets, butt naked for a whole week. Wow. Seven days, no shower. And the torment that I went through on that, man, I mean, the experience in solitary confinement, there's a lot of people who, who it stresses them out. It, I don't think these kids out there realize, man, how hard time can actually be. You know, I mean, they, they, they get these little, they go into the ranch of these level ones, man, but they've never experienced that isolated time that you're going to have to face. It could break you. Yeah, I, I, um, I did it out of my six years. I did a year of it in solitary confinement in Santa Rita. Uh, it wasn't 23 and one, man. I think there was, um, <clears throat> I think there was 32 cells in that pod, if I'm correct. And by the, between breakfast, lunch, dinner, visits, nurse visits, count time, you, you couldn't cycle 32 cells in a 24 hour period. Anyways, you can't because 24 hours, 32 cells, you know what I mean? So I was coming out maybe every third day, you know, so that was that was crazy, man. I saw this young man from Oakland. I, I can't remember his name, man. He came with the chip in his shoulder, 
found out I was in the pod, found out I was Christian. He was on the other side of the pod and he would be yelling out, cussing me out because basically I was, I was no longer functioning, no longer whatever, you know what I mean? And he was just calling me out, calling me out. And um, when my door popped, I remember I made a beeline for his cell. And I said, hey man, what are you doing? And he was an 18 year old kid chipping his shoulder, you know, Mr. Nortaniel and <laughs> hasn't been through nothing. I'm like, what are you doing? And he's like, he started just talking all this stuff, you know what I mean? And I'm like, listen, man, um, just because I'm a Christian doesn't mean I ain't a man anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, I said, so you can say what you want because there's a door between us. You know, I said, but don't take my kindness for weakness. You know, and after that, he kind of quieted down a little bit. My point is this, after three months, this guy that had a chip in his shoulder, walking around like he owned the pod, within three months, he broke and he was screaming and yelling in a cell. He lost his mind three months to break him in solitary. And um, I had to get at him, man. I had to get at him, pray with him, even after all the things he was saying to me, you know, and we ended up becoming friends, you know, because I'm like, I, I got to help. This is somebody's son. This is somebody, you know what I mean? I'm like, I got to help this kid get his mind back, you know? And we ended up being really good friends. And I basically um, like counseled him through that time. That's awesome. Well, now, before we end this interview, right, because we're on a 40 minute time frame of the Zoom meeting, I want you to discuss your faith and how important faith is and how, how faith can help our youth. I mean, how faith can help an OG, how faith can help our moms. I mean, the importance of faith in today's society, man. This is where I want to end, end this interview. My thing is this, man. I, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be straight up, man. I heard your video on faith and, and I respect everything you said. Um, on my position where I stand and knowing the Bible that I stand, there is only hope in Christ. Christ can break the chains. That's it, man. He's the one that can set you free. And I mean really free. I'm not talking about uh, behavior modification. I'm not talking about trying to be good. I'm talking about completely changing from the inside to the outside and, and letting yourself die so Christ can live in you. This is, this is what I live for. This is what I do because I've seen so many lives change. So many lives change. Thousands of people's change. I've seen so many people change. It would take more faith to not believe in God than to believe in God. I don't know if that makes sense. I believe it. I believe it too. Yeah, I mean, I'm on, I'm on that same page. You know, I, I try to give people the freedom of choice in their beliefs. Yeah. You know what I mean? But um, I'm a committed Christian, and I, I can say for myself, man, it wasn't until I started praying for God yeah. to where he, he removed all these defects and characters that were dragging me down. Like, it, it's the bondage that was holding me back was basically up here and, and not willing to give into anything, a, high, a power greater than myself. And once I started giving my life over to God, all these good things happened, all these doors opened, up, and, and now I can do God's work, man. Like, that's my whole focal point is to be of service, man, because... I don't know about you, but me, I've done so much damage in these communities, in these neighborhoods all over California, destroyed families, destroyed homes. And so I feel like I have to make a living amends. Like if someone gets at me and they need help, I have to answer that call. Yeah. If someone gets at me on an email and will ask for advice, I have to respond. You know what I mean? That's the life that I live because in my opinion, I'm trying to do God's work out there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If everybody starts to do God's work and try to help each other, I feel like we can push our people in the right direction. Yeah. Well, especially with all the negativity going on in society nowadays, man. It's like exactly. everybody's scared to use the word God. You know what I mean? They're, they're scared to say that they're a Christian. It's like you say you're a Christian nowadays, everybody looks at you weird. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, I, I hear you. I hear you what you're saying. And, and for me, I mean, we just got to reach. We got to be there. You know, I love what you guys are doing even with the LA times and Paul and Joe and, and all those guys and Sonny and uh, Cholo trucker. And it's just going to keep growing and keep growing and keep growing. This is a dream that I thought I would never see happen. And I don't know where it's going, you know, and, and, and who knows where it's going to end, but I like the way it's going. And I just want to be part of this and do our part. You know I mean? We don't, we have no idea what this could lead to. And it's a beautiful thing, man. Okay. Most definitely. All right, Pastor Rocha, I want to thank you for having me on this show, man. Everybody, if you guys want to check it out, the House of Rest, what else, what other websites do they have that they can check out? Your YouTube channel? Yeah, YouTube channel is David Rocha. We have uh, we have sermons, Bible studies, daily devotionals. 
um, meaning like we pick a little Bible verse and we and I break it down in relevant times. Like, what does that mean to us now today? We have Instagram, uh, it's House of Rest, um, Facebook, David Rocha, same thing. Uh, and our website is www.houseofrestchurch.com. All right, thank you. Thank you for ha having you on the show. No, I appreciate you guys, man. And keep keep doing what you're doing. Man, that's what we're trying to do, man. Ro Rose over message me, tell me we only have like six minutes left. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's all good. Like two minutes left, man. 